Hello, all you beautiful, sexy human beings. Welcome to Center of Light on this Tuesday night, May 7th. Tonight, we're going to go to heaven. <laughs> I have a guest tonight, Mike Beaver and I. We're going to be talking about how to create a utopia on Earth. This is my kind of gig. This is what I'm all about. It's helping not only myself, but in the helping of myself, uplift contribute to the welfare of humanity so that we all take a ride a little high up, if you know what I mean. Center of light, center of divine enfoldment and reinforcement. Strap in all my brother and sister astronauts as we launch for inner space, center of light radio. Radio to ignite your soul and the transformation station. I love all these little words. Uh, I want to tell you about an event that's going to take place on September 21st and 22nd. It's the Four Points Spiritual Expo in Memphis, Tennessee. Two-day pass, 20 bucks. One-day pass, $15. I will be a keynote speaker. Larry Flaxman has been on the Discovery Channel on Ancient Aliens. He's going to be a keynote speaker. There's going to be vending booths, of course, of all sorts. Auric photography, I sure hope so. Stones everywhere. Teachers, best-selling authors, people you can meet and greet and touch. Get a little close inside their, their, their field kind of see what that energy is about you know those people that we kind of look up to and hopefully um, point the way out of the wilderness so to speak September 21st and 22nd four points spiritual expo you want more information on that contact me I want to get you involved come to town a day early leave a day late I play music all the time come out and see one of my shows we all wake up in the morning and have breakfast Nothing like a road trip, right? <laughs> I am now giving readings. I am also doing counseling. I refer the word counseling slash readings kind of thing. Though I am intuitive, I don't play psychic. Please don't ask me if you're going to get married next year. I won't answer your question. Instead, if you ask me, Keith, what can I do to create fertile ground to bring a partnership experience into my life? I'd be more than happy to work with you. I'd rather empower you, right? very very important when you're seeking spiritual sustenance that you find people who give you quality quantity's cool i ain't got no, i'm not anti-quantity that's for sure please share this to you all you can find me also at center of light radio on youtube center of light radio please subscribe to my page my visibility is getting greater and here you will see a donate link to support my work. I do it because I love doing this. And I'm able to do this for the last quite a few years. And will push forth with your support and your help. Notify me when Keith goes live. You're going to find some links in here. Um, one of those is, oh, actually, this is the ellipsis, the three dots. That way you don't miss any of the presentations or broadcasting I do after this interview with Mike Beaver, I'm going to be doing a presentation titled 
sitting in the lap of God. I'm nervous because I know the joy and the bliss I'm going to have in there, and I'm not going to want to come back. <laughs> we're going to be right back with my guest, Mr. Mike Beaver, and we're going to be talking about creating a utopia on Earth. Might as well breathe. Trust that I will guide you in whatever you do. Just remember to breathe and do your very best to live in love. Give in love. Be in love. And love you shall receive.
Welcome back to Center of Light Radio, my friends, my tribe, Yana Vites. Let's get right down to Center of Light Radio business. Let me tell you about my guest tonight. Let me find my notes. My guest tonight is Michael, Mike Beaver. Mike says, I, Michael Beaver, go by the name Mike, am a hypnotherapist. As such, I have worked with one abductee used as a breeder for one of the gray races, have assisted one client to remove a dark spirit attachment. As an information technology professional with over 41 years of computer experience, I have worked over 60 professional IT related contracts. My clients include the CIA, the FBI, Defense Security Services, DISA, D-I-S-A, the Library of Congress, the Treasury Department, NATO, the Army, the Air Force, the Marines, Microsoft, Shell, Amoco, Conoco, and the list goes on and on and on. At the world's largest training center of any kind, I, with the help of a vendor, almost single-handedly stopped a congressional investigation. While working for NATO as a contractor, I was a part of Petrus's daily briefing for a short period when he ran the Afghan conflict. I am an honor degree videographer, an award-winning photographer, and a student of Chuck Norris's best friend <laughs> is one of his best students. I worked as a stuntman in the motion picture industry and as a freelance videographer, grip and worker bee. I love this cat already. For over a decade, I fell off buildings, did martial arts, took action photographs, directed, ran video camera, and acted on rare occasions. Though I have never said a single word in any movie or PSA. I'm an amateur ufologist, a web page administrator, an unpublished author looking for an agent, and have been occasional ET contact. Uh-oh, look out. Here we go. Since my first close encounter on August 3rd, 1980. You can find more about my guest Mike Beaver at profoundstates.com. Mike, welcome to Center of Light Radio, sir. Well, thank you for having me on your show. It's October 3rd, 1980, but otherwise you got it pretty, you got everything else pretty good. <laughs> I, I am such a multitasker like you after reading that bio. I'm, I'm thinking, my God, what a resource of an individual to have in the wilderness <laughs> on Earth. <laughs> well, I don't know about that. Uh, in the IT world, I get around, but uh, I don't know about the wilderness. I've been around. I've been in the, the – uh, my dad used to take us to the uh, – out in the wilderness when I was a kid, so it's fun. Mike, as I told you in the green room or shared with you in the green room, one of my passions is when I speak about anything, uh, just be it with some friends over a bite of food or a spiritual or my work, it's the heaven on earth idea. It's the utopian society. It's the place that we all desire, deserve, and I think all of humanity, though most may not know they're looking for something. Everyone is looking for something. We can see it in their eyes. How did you get into this entire movement way of living lifestyle thought process what was it that actually pushed you passionately into this arena well uh, I've always had an interest in uh, things that are unusual but uh, I guess the first event that is really kind of big would be my first close encounter on October 3rd 1980 but uh, probably Around that same time, I started experiencing, um, uh, you know, spirits of a, a non-physical nature. So, you know, I've been plagued by the paranormal and uh, all my life. So. But, you know, there's, it's, I've had uh, three close encounters with craft, two, two uh, close encounters with beings in my apartments, and uh, or you know, in my apartment or out, and uh, and I've had a lot of paranormal. I have paranormal experiences. To me, that's like uh, not something you have. It's like something you are. 
I have uh, two. Here's something you probably don't know about me. I have two attaching spirits, one that sits on my head and one that sits on my back. They're both demonic, and uh, I've had them since uh, I started smoking pot at the age of 16 or 18. I started smoking at the age of 16, but I don't know exactly when I got the attaching spirits. But uh, creating the utopia um, has to do with mankind understanding how these spirits affect how, how they cause all the things. If, if you go look at my uh, title of my book, that's one place we can start. It's just the title itself. So I'll read it and you can kind of get an idea of what I'm talking about. The book is entitled Inst Instruments of Control, How uh, Attaching Spirits Cause War, Terrorism, Crime, Racism, Murder, Insanity, Mental Illness, Molestation, Marital Discord, Suicide, and many other illnesses and are leading humanity to its fourth impending fall. So if you think about all the, the uh, things in that title, uh, if you kind of wonder why the world is so screwed up as much as it is, it's a perfect place, but it's also a very imperfect place. And so uh, all those issues are really symptoms of one underlying issue, and that is attaching spirits. So when mankind uh, begins to realize that that is the number one problem in the world, then uh, that will start the movement towards the utopia. Are you of the belief or the idea that you've learned through your research? Would you say that these attaching spirits, well, would be considered extraterrestrial because they're not from this particular earth, so to speak? Would you agree with the Corey Good and the David Wilcox and uh, Emery Smith all about the the dark forces are just basically draconians or reptilians or it could be a little bit of both a little some a little more spiritual and not so corporeal no I don't agree with any of that uh, so I'm not saying that uh, aliens can't attach to us that's not I, I don't go there but so I'm not discounting everything they say but if you if any conspiracy that anybody can come up with, does not at the very bottom of it uh, include uh, a, a non-corporeal being, something that is not physical, then it's not, to me, that's not the truth. Uh, so there's a lot of ways we can look at this. Uh, did you by any chance check out um, my webpage at all? I did, and it's very full. <laughs> it's full of content. I mean, it's... Well, why don't you go there now? Because I, I got something that's right up your alley as far as our conversation. And uh, it will help you understand where I'm going to start this with. Because the question you asked me was whether corporeal beings are causing the problem, which, you know, all aliens are corporeal unless you get up to the, the beings of light. You know, when you get to that level, then they're not corporeal. But anything below that is either corporeal or, or semi corporeal. So. I'm with, I'm at your page. So scroll, on the right, you want to scroll down, look for all the words in white. You got Mike Beaver on the far right, then you got recent featured videos, then featured videos, then movies to watch, then the paranormal, then alien abduction, then alien implants, and then change, and then under that, the universe. Just, are you at where I'm talking about? And if, you, if I lost you, there's another way you can find this, too. I'm there. I see it completely. You see where it says the universe? I do. Okay. Underneath it, there is a where it says uh, dark energy and the 4% universe. Hold your control key down and then click the... If you hold your control key down, it will open in another tab. Then you can switch over and you still have your original tab. Wonderful. So, so do you see a pyramid in front of you now? I do, sir. Okay. So this is, uh, this is not string theory, nor is it metaphysics. This is hard science. It's been proven. Uh, basically what happened was back in the 20s, they started uh, observing. I don't know why they started in the 20s, but somebody says the way they started in the 20s, they were observing the universe. I assume that has to do with the telescope. And then in 1933, Hubble announced that our uh, galaxy was not the only one. He's the first person on Earth who said the other galaxies exist. So uh, this pyramid basically 
illustrates in a very simple manner the nature of this realm, what we call the physical plane. So if you notice near the top, about third down, you have the stars. So what we think of as the universe, all the stars in existence is really half of 1% of, the, of, this, of this level, this plane, just this plane of existence, what we call the physical plane. The, all the stars is not even a half percent of, of it. Now, if you go down the next one down, you've got 45%. This is all ordinary matter. Everything, if you listen to the, uh, the, some of the top scientists, people that are very into hard science, they'll tell you that the atom and all that, the molecule, all that stuff is fiction. And when they mean <clears throat> fiction, what they're trying to say is, if you look deeper and wider about the current, techno current uh, understanding, that percentage of the universe is still only 4% of this plane of existence. Okay, <laughs> that includes every molecule, everything. Okay, that's 4%, right? And uh, so if you look below that, you have cold, dark matter, and uh, some of, a lot of the science fiction shows you see on TV are starting to get into dark matter, but nobody really talks much about what's on the bottom, and that's dark energy. Now, my theory, though I don't know it, is that subtle energy, the chi, I don't know how much you know about subtle energy, uh, chi, chi kong, tai chi, uh, the kind of energy that when you do laying on of hands, what you feel with acupuncture, uh, all these, all the subtle energy. I have a theory that dark energy and subtle energy are one and the same. But uh, Western science does not uh, acknowledge subtle energy as being real. But a lot of the Eastern medicines do our Eastern science does. You've got organizations like ICEM and other organizations that where scientists are getting into subtle energy. So the only reason I bring this up, I don't want to bore people with science too much because this is kind of boring, but the reason why I brought it up is because when you talk about corporeal beings like, like aliens, like uh, Dracos and this and that, they're part of the uh, ordinary matter. That's the 4%. But if you get into disincarnates like ghosts, demons, angels, beings of light, anything that is not not what we call physical, uh, a disincarnate spirit of any kind, positive or negative, that's part of the dark. That's part of energy, right? And in, even the physical beings are all. It's all energy. So really, <clears throat> that's kind of even this is kind of uh, misleading a little bit. But well, I want the po only point. I, I want to make in reference to this is that when you talk about uh, any conspiracy that talks about uh, incarnates like a like uh, normal aliens that's only the four percent if it's disincarnates <clears throat> like spirits uh, demons ghosts angels that's the majority so it's like if you do the math if you if you divide four into 60 I think it comes out to be like 240 so for every for every um, alien, you've got 240 disincarnate spirits that exist. That's logic, by the way, this realm is made out. And I don't know if that's absolutely true, but that's just the way you want to look at it as far as, um, you know, how this <laughs> realm is made. And this doesn't include all the other realms. So, uh, in any case, um, let me go back to uh, my own notes so we're not lost. Okay, so um, the way, the path, I want to lay out the path to Utopia first, and then we'll come back and go over um, all the have, have you had visions as to why this is a bit, an active thing for you? Talking about creating a Utopia on Earth, have you had visions and meditations or in some of your excursions in your soul experiences, or why is this alive for you, sir? Well, I have not, but um, I don't tend to get out of my body. I've only been halfway out of my body once in my lifetime. Um, I'm pretty well grounded in my body. Um, I have a, like I said, I have an attaching spirit that sits on my head. It's present at all times. The one that sits on my back is rarely present, but they kind of uh, cemented for me the nature of spirit, the fact that disincarnates affect humans. And do they bother you? Do they just cause you aggravation or do they 
mess well, with you in serious ways or what? Yeah, they 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 cause a lot of hassle. Yeah, the the um, I was riding my bike one time with my wife in uh, Portland, Oregon, and I was way ahead of her, and I was re- I was in a really good mood at the time, and um, I was coming up on a bridge, and then the attaching spirit that sits in my head kind of took over. Uh, all the input into my eyes, into my brain. And basically what it did was it fed me a false reality. Instead of seeing the bridge I was coming up to, it gave me a, a false bridge. And so I'm seeing my whole world was wrong, was incorrect. Does it want you to die? Well, they tried to kill me in that event. In that event, at least, yeah. Yeah, I've had a tow truck driver try to kill me. I've had a cop try to kill me. I've had a person I will not identify try to kill me. I've had a, a, an organization which I've yet to identify try to kill me. I've had my attaching spirit try to kill me. And uh, yeah, so I've had quite a few different uh, entities try to kill me. So, uh, and I've almost killed myself. Ra- I was racing a buddy of mine and uh, didn't have a helmet on. And that was it. I was in a coma for about three days. I should, have you have you ever seen have ever, you ever seen this being like in, in a vision or did you have an impression of what this thing is? I mean, it's a squid like, jelly like, just leech like, demon like. What? It's uh, well, okay. So uh, again, when I was uh, in Portland, Oregon, I was sitting. I, I used to go over to this girl's house. She was a um, she was into interesting things like me. We went over there to try to get out of our bodies. So we were listening to Robert Monroe's uh, hemispheric synchronization tapes back when they were the rage and uh, try to get out of our bodies. I never succeeded uh, when I was over at her place, but we were sitting across from each other. Uh, There was a card table between us and she looked at me and she said, you know, you know, you have an imp jumping around on the top of your head, don't you? And And it was jumping around on the top of my head at the time. So I knew by the fact that she could, she claimed she could see it. Plus, she described what it was doing accurately at the time. I knew she was actually seeing it. So, moving forward, I was in a jail cell, also in Portland, Oregon. Uh, it's called the the Justice Center, and I was sitting on the uh, cell. I was on the cell floor, and I was doing uh, a yoga meditation that I used to do, Kriya Yoga, and uh, I would. I was in semi-lotus position, and I would bow my head down, and I would move to the right, and then I would move to the left, and I would come up, and I was circulating, circulating subtle energy uh, chi through my chakras. And when I finished, uh, I kind of opened my eyes and I looked over at my cellmate. He was sitting on the bottom bunk, and he looks at me and he says, "You know, you have a demon sticking its tail <laughs> in, in your back." Uh, he said, you know, you have a demon sticking its tail in your back. And, uh, and I did, you know, when the girl told me about the one on my head, oh, the one on my head, I already knew about it when she told me. So she was just confirming what I already knew. But when the, when the, uh, Jason, uh, my cellmate told me about the one on my back, I wasn't aware of that one at the time. So I moved my awareness to the, my back and focused there. And I could feel the very sharp pain in my back that it causes, uh, on rare occasion. And then I could also feel the energy signature around that sharp pain. And uh, so at that, because I could feel that energy signature, I knew that the sharp pain was not uh, a normal back pain. And there was also a time I was on an airplane and I was sitting with a lady and I was trying to tell her about attaching spirits. And I said, you know, you, if you have a back pain and it's moving around and it's not stationary, that's not a normal back pain. And she goes, well, normal back pain is supposed to move around. I said, I almost started laughing. Uh, I said, no, a normal back pain is in one position. You have, a, you have a, a disc that's out. You have a muscle tear. You have something physical. It does not move around. It's in one position only. Okay. So if you have a, a sharp pain in your back and it moves around all over the place, that's, not a, that's a, an attaching spirit. And, th- and there's no getting rid of this for you. Uh, well, if you let me talk to you about my plan of the future, I'll, sh- I'll tell you how we're going to get rid of it. <laughs> All right. Okay, so. 
You see, I'm just full of questions, though. When I get a guest on that's intriguing to me, when he when he mentions something that I really want to know a little more about, that's when I, that's my job to come in and say, give me a little more of this spiritual nugget, please. <laughs> okay, well, uh, for some reason, my, my document is not moving, but that's okay. I got it all in my head. Uh, so, in the future, what I think we should do is I'll be at a uh, an event. It could be a MUFON meeting. It could be uh, it could be anything. There's an event, and there'll be a crowd there. They're sitting in their chairs. I'm sitting in my chair. But my chair is either up on a stage facing the crowd, or it's just facing them on the same level. And there's a uh, a snake of people coming on the side of the uh, theater, and it comes up and it stops uh, six feet or so from me. And there's a guy standing at the head of the line. And he's holding a watch, and he tells the person at the head of the line whether they, when they can go uh, beyond the head of the line to, to the position behind me. So when, when the person at the head of the line moves to behind me, they will stick their arm out to the left on my left side. And when I see their arm go out, I will grab it. They should close their eyes, relax their arm, and, and relax their body, and make sure there's no tension in their arm. And then I will place their hand on the top of my head where my attaching spirit is sitting at that moment. And I've done this with my wife, and she could feel the energy, the tingling, uh, the vibration from the attaching spirit sitting on my head. If she can feel it, anybody can feel it. And if that's the case, in this crowd, with uh, this whole event being video recorded, uh, it'll be put on YouTube or wherever where people can see it. And they'll see the react. Hopefully, they will see the reactions of the faces of anybody who uh, feels the energy of the spirit sitting on my head. And hopefully, they don't go running out of the room. Uh, and uh, we'll probably have to have people stationed at strategic points. So if a person freaks out when they feel this <laughs> energy, they don't like try to run out of the room and run out into traffic or something. So uh, anyway, that's the first part of the uh, step moving forward. So once that happens enough times the world somebody hopefully a couple one or two angels or somebody who decides to put it out as a uh, as a crowdfunded event we take it to the next level and uh, fund a, a contest to see who can uh, develop a uh, technology that can see attached spirits are you familiar with the zero lux camera I'm not, but I was going to ask you about, could it be captured in an art photography, or is the light spectrum or angstroms, or are they just too high to pick up on such lower vibration? Well, uh, art photography, what it, the, the ones I've seen, what they do is that you put your, you put your hand on an uh, electronic device, and it reads the energy off of your hand. It's not really reading the energy off of your body. And then it just puts your, your picture in the middle of that energy. It's not really reading. It's through a software process. It's not actually capturing. Right. There, okay. is, a guy, there is a guy who has technology, and he's, he's got, there's a video. I have a link to it on my website. Um, he, has, he has technology that, that is supposed to be able to see attaching spirits. However, um, I even question his technology. So um, the thing about... Uh, I'm gonna, just for a second, I'm going to go over Zero Lux cameras so you understand that we already have actual technology that sees see spirits in real time. It's called Zero Lux. It's infrared. So uh, let me take you to one event and I'll, I'll demonstrate. So I was at a, um, a ghost hunter, a ghost hunting event in a ghost town. It's called Skycomish, Washington. It's uh, kind of hard to find on a map. You may find Snohomish. But Skycomish is even harder to find because it really is a ghost town. So uh, at this event, um, we were walking around. Uh, at night, there's no power in this town. All the light bulbs are dead. Uh, the only thing that has power in the town is the hotel. And uh, the only thing that hotel has is people coming there to see, to see the ghosts. So we were there, uh, had a whole bunch of people to come see the ghosts, and we're walking around the street, and this girl lets me borrow her third-generation night vision goggles, 
and I could see with those things on pretty good, but um, there was a point where uh, there was a girl, uh, a paranormal and UFO investigator or alien investigator. Uh, she had a Sony Zero Lux infrared camera. Uh, and she was standing, it, it just come on the market like the week before. And she was standing right in front of me. So I'm looking, I'm looking at the little uh, readout that is, you know, live uh, video that's coming through the camera. And so as we're walking around, these ladies, it was, it was 98% women. There was only like one or two of us guys. And all the women were fairly psychic. And they were looking up and they were seeing the orbs, which are ghosts. And they were flying all around and they were seeing them. And I wasn't seeing squat because I, I, I can be very psychic sometimes, but usually I'm not that good at it. And, uh, but sometimes I can, I'm pretty psychic. But anyway, I'm not seeing any of the orbs personally. But one of the orbs came over her and I and without me seeing it, goes, it goes down in front of the camera and then it starts flying in a figure eight formation like an infinity sign. And I know bugs don't fly in an infinity sign. So I knew that was something <laughs> that was not a uh, bug. And so um, anyway, uh, later on, she sent me a, co a VHS copy of a tape with all the orbs flying around on the, on the tape. And it had that uh, orb flying around in, a, in, a, uh, in a, an infinity symbol fashion. And on there, and I watched it like half a dozen times, checking out that one part of the tape, because that was the most impressive part of the tape. The rest of it you can discount as bugs because they're just zoomed past the camera, and you can't really get a, an eyeball on the on the orbs. So I was working at Microsoft one day, and I was talking to these people about ghosts and this and that, and they're skeptics like most people. I said, well, let me go home and get my tape. And I brought it I brought it to work and went upstairs and we sat down in front of this large uh, flat screen TV back when they were extremely expensive at that time and stuck the VHS tape in there and hit play. And and we were seeing the orbs go past and they're, they're going, oh, those are just bugs. And so I fast forward it looking for the figure eight uh, formation of the one orb. And guess what? It's no longer on that tape. It had been. It had, <laughs> of course. <laughs> it had uh, disappeared from the tape, but the tape never got edited after I received it. So it did, that part of the tape just disappeared without any editing. And that's actually a fairly common phenomenon when you record on magnetic media. Uh, paranormal phenomena will disappear over time. Um, you know, so anyway. Um, so, uh, where was I? Oh, so if uh, that technology can be moved forward to, you know, the next level, if you can, if you can see orbs or, or spirits flying around, ghosts flying around with a zero lux uh, infrared camera, then somebody ought to be able to take that type of technology and take it to the next level where they can see attaching spirits as as well. And if you put out a contest like one million dollars, ten million dollar contest, yeah, that'll, right. <laughs> that'll be a lot of money to uh, to incentivize the uh, creation of such technology. Mike, we are at the space where we're going to go to commercial break and we were leading into slowly but surely because I know you you are so full. You have so many things. Um, leading into how this is this this energy we're talking about is wedging its way between Heaven on Earth, Utopian Society, and we're going to go to that segment, if that's cool with you, sir. Talk about your vision or your idea, your understanding of what it will take to bring us all into this perfect world where everyone is, as it needs to be, balanced for everyone. Sounds good. Are you are we going to commercial <laughs> or you want me to say something? <laughs> we're going to go to commercial break. Everyone, Keith Anthony Blanchard here with my guest, Michael Beaver. Tonight we're talking about creating a utopia on Earth and other really cool things. Stick around, I'll be right back. Remember that all things are possible. You must choose to be accountable, responsible, enough to believe, and open your heart to receive.
turned out this way and not the way you planned It's about what you know and what you understand Choice, life's a choice It's a choice, your life is a choice Choice, life's a choice It's a choice, your life is a choice Learn to follow that inner voice inside be when you visualize it's about what you choose Welcome back to Center of Light Radio. Keith Anthony Blanchard here. Yana Vav with my guest, Mr. Michael Beaver. And we are speaking about lots of really cool things. I love this kind of stuff. As well as our main theme is creating a utopia on Earth. Welcome back to Center of Light Radio, sir. Good to see you, Michael. I'm back. A couple of people from the chat room. Hello, everyone in the chat room. Well, somebody says, this. let's keep this short because I do want to move into that segment about utopia. But someone asked, is this why exorcisms happen because of these said attachments that you were talking about? Yes. So, um, so if you want, I can tell you the last step of the three steps. I gave you the first one, which was, uh, I prove, you know, I have people check out my attachment spirit by touching my head, uh, and seeing their facial reaction. The second one being, uh, crowd or angel funding a uh, technology to see attaching spirits and uh, just like the zero X camera can see moving spirits and the third the final the last piece is to have uh, a crowd or angel funded uh, contest uh, of a big nature which would fund uh, somebody who can actually remove attaching spirits to, to be able to, they have to come up with a technique that can be easily taught to everybody else. Now, if they can prove that any particular technique can be taught to the average person who can use it to effectively remove attaching spirits, then uh, sort of we're on our way to utopia because all the negative things that happen in this world are a result of these attaching spirits. That includes war and everything in that ti the title of my uh, of my book, war, terrorism, uh, just anything you can think of, it's all caused by attaching spirits. And so if you, if you can remove all those attaching spirits, 
that's that's it. You're now on your way to utopia. Michael, let me ask you this: Are you saying that everyone has attachments, or are yes. you saying that yes. a lot of people have? But I want to ask you. I want to finish the question. Is that is it more like there's a ceiling, a veil being created by some of these energies, entities, hence attachments, not letting us through? And I, I know that people have attachments, but do you think that everyone literally has attachments to some degree or another? Uh, well, okay, so I, I can take you through um, almost half a dozen experiences I've had where I've seen evidence of how many people had them and how many, which people didn't have them. I've actually seen it with my own eyes. So it's not a belief. That part is not a belief on my part. Uh, it's knowledge, understanding that I've seen with my own eyes. So, um, you know, if uh, you want to go over those, me to go over those experiences, I can. So, it's your platform, sir. I'll leave it to you. <laughs> all right. Well, so I was standing in a um, in, a, in a, an apartment courtyard in Manassas, Virginia, and there was a lady standing about six foot from me uh, or maybe you know plus or minus a foot or two and i saw her attaching spirits the only one i've ever seen in my entire life came straight off the top of her uh, off her back straight up and then moved forward it looked like um uh, if you thought of thought of a genie like in the cartoons and i don't mean i dream of genie but like uh, a huge male human like a gin, you would think of it as, as a gin. Yeah, uh, yeah. It yeah. looks like a human, but more malevolent. Yes. That's what it looked like. And it scared the you know what out of me. And I almost fell down. I started moving back really quickly and literally almost fell down. But as I started moving back, it disappeared. It was only uh, visible for like maybe five seconds at the most. And so that's the only attaching spirit I've ever seen personally. But uh, the girl who saw the one on my head saw that one. The girl, that one, the guy that saw the one on my back saw that one. But personally, uh, okay, so I have to back up a little bit. I went to the uh, Amazonian jungle in Iquitos, Peru. Iquitos is the largest city in the Amazon rainforest. It's in, it's in Peru. It's called Iquitos, I-Q-U-I-T-O-S. Okay, I did the ayahuasca Three times, big mistake. What? <laughs> really? Yeah. So um, anyway, um, let me first explain how attaching how you get attaching spirits. Um, people smoke marijuana. They smoke cigarettes. They drink alcohol. They uh, do illegal drugs, and they do legal drugs. These are the five ways. There's many other ways of getting attaching spirits but these five methods make holes out of your auric barrier and that's how you i got mine from smoking pot at the age of 16 i started smoking pot and i stayed high morning noon and night for 18 years and um so i was in uh portland with my wife and uh we came across this lady who thought she had healing powers and she, um, I went, my wife and I went down to this place in Southern Oregon where her, her, this lady and her husband lived out in the middle of nowhere. And we walked into their double wide mo uh, mobile home and they were sitting down and she looks at me and she points her finger and she says, you're healed. And in my mind, I said, you're, you're nuts. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, I did of course, I knew at that moment that she had no healing powers. Okay, so but anyway, uh, she was a nice lady, and she wasn't trying to uh, she wasn't trying to uh, fake me out. She actually believed she had the healing power. So, I was, my wife and I were nice to them for for a few hours, and then we left and went back home. And then she called me uh, two, three, six weeks later. And uh, she said, uh, I talked to my psychic friend, and she said, you got your problem, my attaching spirits, she said, your problem, from smoking. But I 
didn't see you smoke. Do you smoke? And of course, her psychic friend never told her the word marijuana. She, so she thought it was cigarettes. So I said, uh, well, I used to smoke, but I've never smoked cigarettes. And so I explained to her that I stayed high for 18 years. And um, from the age of 16 to the age of 34 when I kicked the habit. So uh, her psychic friend basically let me know that I got my attaching spirits from smoking pot. So that's one method. Now let's go back to the ayahuasca because it affects you differently. Instead of breaking down the orc barriers of your aura that's directly around you, it breaks down the barrier, other barriers you have which are further away from your body. People talk about the aura that surround your body, but you have that those barriers, but you also have barriers that are further out than the walls uh, on, in the room you're in. For, beyond those walls, you have other barriers. Well, ayahuasca breaks down those barriers. It's a different set of barriers. Okay, and, it completely blows them out. <laughs> right. Well, you become more psychic. Yeah. You can see what I was. One of the things I saw for two years, I was wide open. And um, I'll give you an example of one of the types of things that happened to me. I, uh, my wife and I would be laying in bed, half asleep, half awake, and uh, we would hear like an explosion in the middle of the living room. Like a, somebody set off a grenade, a, you know, a small grenade in the living room, very, very loud. And the dogs would jump up and start barking their heads off, right? So I would go in the living room and there's nothing in the living room. And, uh, you know, so that's an example. And I, we would hear like knocking, uh, you know, loud knocking, not, not like rapping like ghosts do, but much louder than that. And, uh, and, you know, there's nothing making, you know, th so things are trying to get in. Basically, when you can see the darkness, the darkness can see you at the same time. It's a two way street. Yeah. So, so uh, basically, uh, we need to go back to uh, how I saw people's attachments. But basically, here's how it worked out. After I was open for those two, while I was open for those two years, after doing the ayahuasca, I um, would see people's eyes. I wasn't really looking at their physical body. I was seeing their astral body. And it was, to me, it looked like their physical body. I couldn't tell the difference. I wasn't like I was seeing an aura outside the body. I, it, to me, it looked like their physical body, but I know it was not. And so uh, their eyes would be jumping around in their head like like it was crazy. It would just jump around really quick. Their eyes would jump around really quick. So uh, I'm going to go back to the lady who I just talked about who I saw her attaching spirit. So in that same courtyard on a different day, I saw this little girl during these two years. And she was, she had a little uh, baby uh, boxer puppy that was trying to get away from her. It was barking at me. And, uh, you know, it was very, uh, very mad, upset. And she was holding it, barely able to control it on the end of the leash. And her eyes were jumping around like that. Okay. And then there was a, another day uh, where I was walking on the street. I was basically under spiritual attack. Uh, that day a lot and um, I was walking down the street and I looked at people in their cars people walking on the street literally every person I saw their eyes were doing that okay then there was another event uh, I was in jail for uh, some marital discord issues and I went to see the judge in the courthouse and before I got into the courthouse the actual room, I was in the corridor outside the, the judge's chambers or the judge's uh, room, the courthouse room. I was outside that room in the hallway sitting on a bench seat and I was looking around and I could see that about one third of the people in the room, their eyes were jumping around their head. The other two thirds of the room, the, people, the eyes were all normal. So I, and I knew intuitively that the people whose eyes were moving around really fast were the people who were scheduled to see the judge. They were the people who had committed a crime. So they were influenced to commit a crime. And therefore, you know, 
uh, but their relatives didn't have attaching spirits. So in that case, I was only seeing maybe a third of the people present having attaching spirits or the symptoms of. Okay, and then, but so, uh, so you get an idea of, um, you know, how I was able, how I can see, how I could see at that time uh, the who had attaching spirits and who doesn't. And yes, I mean, literally, everybody has them, but not necessarily at the same time. For instance, let's say a third had them in the past, attaching spirits, a third have them now, and a third will have them in the future. One third plus one third plus one third is three thirds, three goes into three one time. That's basically 100%, but not all at the same time. So that gives you an idea of what I'm talking about as far as, yes, everybody's got them, but not necessarily at the same time. So uh, I can pause and let you ask a question, or I can keep... I'm just taking it all in. So are you saying that, see, Justin Carr from the chat room says, He's done a lot of research about certain societies that tried the utopian idea in the past. Be weary if they failed. But what you are saying is, we I understand everyone efforting and intending as we get our spiritual groove on to move into this, or we creating this window to lift ourselves up to a higher experience. But what I'm gathering from what you are saying is that when we are all able to see kind of like the movie they live but when we are able to see the attachments we're able to remove them naturally humanity with its weight off of it will lift naturally and therefore we'll be able to see the paradise the the, the utopian society that is already there in other words basically one of the things i'll always say mike is through the silence, suddenly the new world appears. So in other words, when the attachments are removed because we see them and we do the work and we are able to see them lift, move off uh, of people, then our consciousness is going to expand and lift and therefore we get to see into different bandwidths, different realities, different dimensions of our own now new signature vibration. Yes? Well, I, I personally think you've got it about half correct. Okay, so, uh, <laughs> I'll take that. <laughs> um, so the way I look at it, if you look at the title of my book and you look at all the things that are listed there, if mankind realizes first that we have attachment spirits, not not uh, through my video, you know, they videotape me and people touch my head and they see people uh, having a reaction facially to being able to feel the energy of the being that they can feel underneath their hand, just like my wife did, uh, that's the beginning. That's when people can see that it's real, that attaching spirits are real, that they're not maybe, that they're factually real. Then when we can come up with uh, an ability to see them, not through our mind, but through technology, uh, like the Zero X camera, see them for sure in real time, that's like the next level of, they really exist, you know, not just maybe, but we've pro sort of proven they exist at that point. And then even before that point where we develop that technology, like when you go into a, a haunted house and you, uh, if you can see the spirit with zero X camera, fine, you have evidence, but you also have evidence like uh, measuring the temperature when a, a spirit, a positive or negative, whatever it is, yeah. pulls pulls energy out of the atmosphere thing it gets it starts getting cold really quick that's just a thermometer we got those right so there's all kinds of technology you could use to actually uh determine that i have an attaching spirit even before you can vi see it visually on a video camera so uh there's ways to do this even before we develop this new technology to get it started and but we have to have the motivation and the money to do it. What would be your first go to? John Doe, Jill Doe has an attachment. They contact Michael Beaver. <laughs> From your research, your experience, what would be your first go to to pry that baby off? Well, I've only had one success so far. I've, as a hypnotherapist, I've worked with half a dozen people, only one of them had success, the rest did not. So there are people like Shakuntala Modi and many others who uh, can remove attaching spirits uh, successfully, more, far more successfully than me. 
supposedly. Now, uh, but what what is the technology that you would think would be the first that would be applied? Spiritual technology using bodily energy of someone who might be righted and balanced and centered within their heart and illumined, or is something else? Well, there are a number of people who claim they can. You know, uh, I, if you actually look on my page, I actually have links to people who claim, you know, like they're at events where, you know, they're, they're having like, um, like the event like you're having that you announced earlier. They're at those events and they actually actively are removing people's attachments while everybody's just sitting around doing, you know, what, whatever they're doing. Entertainment. <laughs> right. And then at some point, they say, well, what we really want to do is teach people how to do this themselves because you can do this yourself. Well, if that's true, then maybe that person will get that one million or that 10 million to teach it to a dozen people. And if they can teach it to a dozen others, and then all those people get together and they can prove that they can remove attaching spirits, every single one of them, then the guy who started it gets the 10 million or the one million. Whatever that technique is not terribly important. It's just a matter of that everybody can use that technique. The average person can use it and it works every time. So but, once we begin to remove these attachments, what then? What do we do to further the cause moving towards the goal of creating a very balanced, unified, peaceful world? What do we do after the attachments are gone? Well, okay, so let me, let me go to the uh, events themselves as far as you know the things that are in the title of my uh, the title of my book I, I want to give you some proof that you know how do you even know that war is caused by attaching spirits you, you don't so I have to give you a little bit of evidence along those lines so you have some notion that I'm even halfway correct so once uh, so let me give you a little bit of I'm going to read you a, a, uh, a quote. Uh, first of all, do you do you ever watch uh, Dead Files? Dead Files or X Files? Dead Files. No, I have not. I, I really don't lean into TV as much as I used to, but I do like programs like that, but not not on that one, no. Well, uh, Dead Files is just another of the many many paranormal shows that's on TV. There's a girl whose name is Amy Allen. She's a psych. She's one of the best psychics alive, and she uh, goes through haunted houses, and she uh, goes around and she makes mental note of of what's in the house. And she has a buddy who's a, a former. She, he's a retired police detective, and he. I know the show you're speaking about now. I've seen one or two episodes. Yes. Okay, so I want to read you a quote. It should take less than two minutes. So she, she's the, the spiritual person, and he's the nuts and bolts kind of guy, right? Right, correct. <laughs> so I'm going to read you a quote from one. It's uh, a show that came out in 2011. It's season six, episode six. It's called The Dark One, and it's in Abilene, Texas. Okay, I'm going to read it, it's, if you don't mind. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but the Jumanos occupied this land when the Spanish first show up. So they were here until probably about early, the early 1700s. Early 1700s, Plains Apaches then come in and displaced the largely pedestrian Jumanos. Wow, I've never heard of Indians displacing each other. This was a blood feud. So how bloody of a battle are we talking about? If you're a, if you're a fallen warrior, you can expect to have your corpse mutilated. Uh, they cut off your hands, cut off your fingers, really very brutal. And then the Apaches are driven out by the Comanches. This goes for 100 years. So we're talking uh, from the mid-1700s. Uh, yeah, all the way into the early 19th century. I mean, they fought the Apaches hammer and tongs. I mean, they never gave up fighting the Apaches until the very, very end. Geez, they scalped people. They'd eat livers sometimes. If they could make you scream or beg for mercy, that's the ultimate power. These guys sound like not somebody you want to mess with, right? How do the how do the white settlers how do the white settlers wind up dealing with it? Well, the settlers were on the losing uh, end for several decades. I mean, really, the Comanches ruled the roost out here from about 1770 to about 1870. 
There's a lot of anonymous dying in this part of the world. There's a lot of panic. This old dude is talking. He's like saying, there's all of these wars that happen, and he's talking about the Native Americans. Well, like when the Native Americans, I just see them like fighting, and then I just see them dead. I see their blood on the ground. There's other people later. So I keep seeing like different groups of people over time, and they're just dead on the ground bleeding. So what I'm thinking is that this thing is, cause, is causing it. It's like instigating and fueling it. Yes, yes. This is Amy Allen, Steve Deshavi of the American TV series Dead Foss, uh, talking about how the intertribal warfare of the American Indian was caused by disincarnate forces. So this is one psychic who uh, says that the Indians So the Indians did not have attachments. It, it sounds that's what you said because these people came in and brought this virus, <laughs> this energetic spiritual virus. So I would think at least they were definitely a pure people anyway. Well, the, what the point I just made through that show is that war is caused by disincarnate. It's not so much whether they're attached or not. If uh, did you ever see the t original TV series Star Trek? Oh yeah. It's been a long time, but yeah. Okay, so there's a there's an episode called um, Day of the Dove, and in that episode you see uh, uh, Captain Kirk and the Klingons. They're on a space station together, and they're killing each other. And when they kill each other, they die, and then they come back to life, and they start killing each other again. And it keeps going on and on. And at one point in the show, Captain Kirk looks up in the sky, up in the up in this room up in the air and there's a non uh, a disincarnate spirit force being a non corporeal being he looks at it and he realizes that it's hovering there and he realizes this force is feeding off of this war between the klingons and the uh humans. now what i've just told you that amy allen reveals about here on earth between the indians same thing whether it's attached or not is sort of unimportant but most likely the spirits came in and attached and instigated the war through by attaching and then causing the conflict that way so yeah they had a they probably had attaching spirits and that's the way that star trek episode goes too and so uh anyway uh, Mike, I just want to give you a heads up that we have 15 minutes left to the show. That way you can kind of navigate your, your presentation with me, uh, interview with me to the things of it as making this a nice, complete package by the time we get there. Uh, from the chat room, someone asked a question, um, and I think it, that's meant in a loving way, just out of curiosity. Do you believe in God or science? And I asked the question, why can't it be both? But that's the question that was posed to you, sir. Well... The almost pretty much the first thing in my book are two phrases: Hugh Elahi Alahu. That's Hugh Elahi El Alahu. The other phrase is Om Tat Sat Om. Both phrases start with Hugh and end in Hugh with Hugh, or are in starting in with Om. These are two names for God. So both phrases mean God. It's the, it, they start in with God and end with God. So it's God something God. Well, the something is exists. Nothing exists but. So that's the way I see God. God is the only thing that exists. There's nothing else. That's There's it. nothing else. I am so with you, bro. There is nothing else. Everything else is a self-created illusion. Right. You know, it, it's everything. You know, even certain scripture says God is omnipresent. Well, let's go to our resource for language. We go to the dictionary and look up omnipresent. It says present in all places at all times. So the only place it isn't is in the illusion that we fabricate for ourselves, assuming that God is not there. Well, even the attaching spirits are part of God. There's Correct. no, there's no, there's nothing outside of God because that's that's where it starts. It's impossible. It's how it, end, it ends. Yeah. It never. Right. The, the 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 creature we call God is uh, never beginning and never ending. That's what it says in the scriptures. Yes. Yeah. So. Uh, there's one other thing I'll tell you really quick. Uh, when I was working at Wilford Hall, the Air Force's largest medical facility, there was a, a guy there that was far more technical than me. He, uh, we had lunch there in the dining facility. It's called it's called a defect for the military. So when we got together to eat uh, our lunch, I shook his hand. His father 
is or was an exorcist. And as a kid, he uh, helped uh, hold down people his father was exercising. And so after he shook my hand, we were sitting there eating and we're talking about all this esoteric stuff. And one of the things he said to me was, as soon as I shook your hand, I knew you had uh, attaching spirits. He didn't say it in those words, but that's what he said. So that's, he was the third person who knew that I had attaching spirits. So anyway, uh, piecing this all together into one thing as a final deal. Uh, yeah, why not? Let's go for it. <laughs> well, okay, so you're an Art Bell fan, right? Oh, for years. I haven't heard, I, every once in a while when I play music late night, I'll put it on. Of course, art's not there, but I still like the program. The program has always been of a dark nature, midnight in the desert, and I get all that. But I, I've, all, I've listened to it for 15, 20 years. Okay, yeah. so um, one night, the psychic, this girl called, she's a psychic, right? And he had asked for people to, uh, she, he said, I know there's a lot of psychics out there. I want one of you to tell me where I lost my watch at, where it's at. So this girl calls up. I was listening to this live when it happened. And she said, I'm so-and-so. Do you know who I am? And he said, no, who are you? And she said, I'm the girl who called in and told you where your watch was. And she said, you were up on your roof. And I told you you were up on your roof. You got sweaty. You came down. You came into your uh, to your building. And you... Uh, you were sweaty. You took off your watch. You stuck it in a drawer right next to your, de your desk. There, you went in, took your shower. He looks in and he finds his watch. She reminds him about that previous call where she successfully told him where, how he lost his watch and where it was. Right, and then the, as soon as she gets through telling the story on her second call into the show, the next thing she said was, "You know these school shootings?" And he goes, "Yeah." And he said, "My what I'm getting." my sources is that they're caused by dark influences so that's the terrorism okay so I've just gone over the I've gone over the war now I've gone over the terrorism now we're gonna go over the crime so another caller Dart Bell show he said I was a bank robber I was successful as a bank robber for many years and then they caught me I was put in prison and I'm in this cell and my cellmate is writhing around on the on the cell floor, and he says to me, you need to give me an exorcism. And he looks at the guy and he goes, I'm not an exorcist, there's no way. And and they argue back and forth. And at some point, uh, he says, okay, okay, I'll do it. And he makes something up, and it succeeds. And these spirits come out of this uh, person, and uh, he said the cell got really dark and strange. And, uh, and then Art asked, him, <laughs> Art, Art asked him, he says, how many of the people in prison have attaching spirits? He said, 100%. So that's your crime. So I've gone over, I've gone over terrorism, war, and crime. So we're going to do one more. Okay, speeding. I was in Austin, Texas. I, was, I showed up late to a ghost hunter's meetup. I walked in the room. And I walked to the far side of the room and sat down, and this girl was already speaking at a podium. She wasn't talking about ghosts. She was talking about demons. I wasn't expecting her to talk about demons, but she's talking about the lady who's sitting next to her. She's a witch. Her, her daughter sitting next to her is also a witch. They conjured up a demon. Then they called the paranormal researcher who was speaking at that moment and asked her to come and get the demon out of their place because they could conjure it up, but they couldn't get rid of it. So she went into the place, the demon immediately attacked her, and uh, she's telling the story. So when she gets through telling the story, she falls silent, and the crowd start ask, starts asking her questions. They finish asking her question and the room questions, and the room falls silent. So I start in. I start asking her questions. So the, the one question I asked her, which was, uh, I asked her, you know, the one I remember, the question I remember was, of all the symptoms you got from the spirit demon attacking you, which one lasted the longest? She said, speeding. And I said, speeding, everybody speeds. And she said, everybody has attachments. <laughs> she said, her reply was, I don't speed. I didn't speed. I've never sped for two weeks after coming out of this dwelling. She did. I forgot if it was a house or apartment. She said, I sped around for two weeks and then it wore off and I went back to where I don't speed. I've never sped. I don't speed. I sped for two weeks after coming out of that place. 
those, so there's your war, terrorism, crime, and speeding. So I've given you some proof about all of them. Now, headaches. I get headaches. I know where they come from. That's muscle tension in my neck. Most people carry it in their shoulders. It goes up. The muscles go from your shoulders up into your head. So if you have headaches, if you have a headache that's very localized, it's not spread out, and if you put your hand on your headache, it goes away. You take your hand off, it comes back. You put your hand on, it goes away. And you can feel an energy on your hand, underneath your hand, around your hand. You have an attaching spirit. Let's go to back aches. You have a sharp pain in your back. It stays in one position, it's a normal back pain. It moves around, it's an attaching spirit. So I'll give you one more, that's depression. I was on a phone call, I was on a phone call with a photographer friend of mine. He would come over, he would look at my photos and he would go, This is crap, that's crap, that's crap, that's crap. And he would he was nice enough to tell me my photography sucked, but it was only because of technical difficulties like out of focus, this and that. But he was honest, right? So I told him on the phone, I said, I'm depressed. His reply was, You're being influenced. You know you're being influenced, don't you? And I thought about it, and I, and I realized, yeah, he was right. I was depressed because I was being influenced to be depressed. So that's so I've gone over war, terrorism, crime, speeding, depression, and I could go on and on. The point is, is that all the things in the title of my book are caused by attaching spirits. When we get rid of them, we'll get rid of war, crime, terrorism, and all the other things that afflict this world will be gone. At that point, we won't be a, you know, it won't be a Star Trek utopia, but I think we'll be nice enough where the aliens can land openly, and we're not going to just bring out our shotguns and start killing them. And then, with their help, then we can become a real utopia. That's my plan, and I'm sticking with it. And it may not come, it may not ever play itself out. It may not come to pass but I'm sticking with it as long as I am alive. I really enjoyed that, so I enjoyed your story, your involvement, your vision. I'm doing the same thing differently. We're coming at it from all <laughs> angles, but I think our intention is completely the same, as well as many other spirituals throughout this world. Every, everyone who is engaging in the dynamic, walking towards a higher experience, not only for themselves, but for everyone, I think everyone has somewhat an, a vision of what this potential world could be once we all get along in a unified society and stop picking on people just for the sake of the fact that they're different. I mean, I think diversity, how can you not like diversity? You know, eating the same food, listening to the same song, hanging out with the same friends, it all just gets long after a while and it brings about frustrations and the world is sort of, I think everyone is frustrated and I think frustration can be a good thing provided it is seen for what it is it's a frustration about something not coming about in the way that most people would like so i think when we take the time to reevaluate ourselves it brings us back to a place of true perspective so we can make different choices well i don't know how much time you have left but basically uh, i got 3 minutes <laughs> basically check out my website profoundstates.com uh, up on the top right hand corner, the biggest link uh, that's or the only link it's link that's in the top right hand corner is the index of my book and a uh, an excerpt about one of my two close encounters with one of my three close encounters with alien craft. Uh, that's the one I encountered with on NASA base before the first space shuttle launch. That uh, an excerpt from that encounter is on my on that page and the index of my book is on that page and so if we have another uh, show in the future we can talk more about uh, aliens and uh, ayahuasca and uh, mind control Mike I've had so many alien experiences and still to this day I go to sleep I, I consider myself I call myself an extraterrestrial target Clarions Pleiadians Lyrans I, I've met the Lyrans for the first time about three weeks ago and so, I mean, they take me up, and next, Mike, I don't know if you noticed this, uh, how many, you did mention, but I forgot because my mind is fleeing elsewhere, but as many times as I've been upon light ships, there are children everywhere, 
children. It's like these light ships are full of children. It's like the whole experience is centered around their children. But we have another full show to do in the future. Well, um, you know, you can interview me about aliens, and then I'll interview you about aliens. Love it. I'll have to tell you about my four-and-a-half-year experience with an alien-human hybrid by the name of Nucleus 8, who lives on a starship, mother station, 27-ish thousand light years away in another dimension. He is head of security for this quadrant of our galaxy. Phenomenal story. This is all related to a 40-year clinical psychologist married to the woman who this being works through. He put her under hypnosis to help her because she was abused most of her life, and then all of this stuff started coming up. <laughs> it's wild. It is just wild. How many times have you been interviewed about all your alien experiences? Probably four, five. And have been well, at least about nucleus eight. And how many times have you been regressed? Twice. Okay. You got to say that so they can hear you. Twice. Twice. Thank you. <laughs> Maybe you can regress me on the air. I ain't got no issue with that if you do. Well, <laughs> I, I don't, I, I don't, have never done a, a remote uh, session. I've never Understood. Done but I'm one of the best hypnotherapists you'll ever meet. But I, you go, brother. I uh, haven't done a session with anybody in a while, but I've made my living through the IT world, unfortunately. But I really enjoy it. If I had Bill Gates' money, I'd probably be spending half my time giving it away. <laughs> a third of my time giving it away, a third of my time changing the world and, you know, getting all the things done that you and I uh, just talked about. I'd probably spend most of my time doing that. But, but I'd also like uh, doing hypnosis because you get to learn all, a lot of the secrets through hypnotherapy. So. Mike, thank you for being a wonderful powerhouse of a guest here on Center of Light Radio. Thank you, sir. Thank you for having me on the show, and I look forward to being on there again. We'll do it again soon. Everyone, Mr. Mike, Michael Beaver. You can find more about this fine gentleman with lots to tell at profoundstates.com. My name is Keith Anthony Blanchett. For those who are interested a little later, in about 30 minutes, at most 45, come back to my wall. I'm going to do a presentation on sitting in the lap of God. I'm excited about this presentation. I look forward to seeing you. Yanava here. Peace, love, and always remember to live in the delicious light of consciousness, awareness, understanding, truth. It's not that hard. It's more easy than it is difficult. If you're trying too hard, you're in your own way. Be good to yourself. See you in just a little bit. Oh, yeah. Have a good one. <laughs>